to another episode of Business Bubble Tea. Here on the podcast today, we have with us Zach Deichtfeldt, the co-founder of the Young China Group. Zach, it's fantastic to have you on the podcast with us today. Thanks so much for having me, Will. Thanks for having me, Roberta. Welcome, Zach. Um, Young China Group, where does this Young China come from? What's the idea behind it? So Young China Group comes from my book, Young China. I am not good at thinking more than one name for things. <laughs> so it, it, it truly was, um, I can tell you the idea behind the book uh, or behind the book title specifically. So yeah. uh, Young China means two things. First, it obviously means young people. Um, there are over 440 million millennials in China, which is larger than the population of the US and Canada combined. Um, and of course, over 700 million people under the age of 40. So large group. And my organization, as did my book, really focuses on a people first and youth forward perspective on China, understanding how that drives economic and political outcomes. Um, the second definition of Young China, though, I think is more interesting. And I, I think it's relevant to your podcast and your listeners, which is the idea of an, of an old culture and an old country, uh, albeit not an, you know, an, an old yep. political entity as it exists today, but an old idea of a country, um, reimagining its identity on the world stage today. So young China, sort of two definitions there. And how, how would you say it is, I guess, reimagining it, if you could almost give us a little blip of, 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 of that? Uh, we're, we're jumping to the end here. I am. Um, so, all right, <laughs> Sorry, so, just so, a quick, a quick uh, no, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> Look, it's the biggest it's the biggest question there is right now. And I think particularly post COVID, this question of of what a pushed and strained China will become versus 10 year bull market China um, are two yeah. different things. Uh, and the background for this is. Uh, I, I talk a lot about generations in China and, and the older generation and the generation that you really see leading government right now, um, as they were growing up, they were they were defined by a subsistence lifestyle, you know, and, and so much of what their identity became was the push to get out of that. And if you can imagine Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this move from the basics, food, water, shelter, being able to take care of your family, moving up that value chain to the more identity oriented uh, criteria, you know, love, companionship, identity, these are identity questions. And um, this young generation was born to poverty, you know, the post nineties generation, the, the per capita GDP in 1990 was 300 bucks. So, you know, not exactly a population no, where don't. that, that could afford bubble tea that, you know, that could afford, yeah. Yeah, exactly. that could, you know, all, all of the, all of the, everything that is now being advertised to China was not viable when this generation was born. It's the first generation who, instead of asking subsistence questions, they get to ask identity questions. And yeah. I don't think we have an answer yet. Like it's not, it's not a hard baked. This is what China will be for the next three, four, five decades. But this is certainly the generation who will define that, who will sort of understand how these two tectonic plates on one side, tradition, what it's meant to be Chinese, what their parents yep. tell them it means to be Chinese, the priorities involved in that. And then this other tectonic plate, which is the pressures of modernity, the, the consumerism, urbanization, uh, education. Uh, and, and how those tectonic plates are grinding against each other. This young generation is at that fault line in between and ultimately will decide how those two graft together in, in a way that, that fits their needs and sense of self. And would you say it's, I guess, a country in transition of kind of negotiating that synergy of, of old, and, old and young? Or Oh, without a doubt. I mean... Look, this is the thing that I would say most people outside of China do not understand. Um, we know that China changes fast, right? This idea yeah. of China speed. Everyone has seen, and you know, for the YouTube That's thing, all you, you hear can, it tends to be, I feel, outside yeah, of China. Yeah, it's, it's like it's those pictures of Shanghai. Country, you know, yeah. The pictures of Shanghai in 1990 with nothing there on the Bund, the picture in 2015 with a lot there on the Bund, and everyone's like, gosh, I wish I invested in real estate. Um, but it's much more than that. People don't yeah. appreciate the psychology of China speed. And because of that pace of change, um, and, and I have some numbers on that that I can share if you're interested, China 
instead of having generation gaps like we do in the UK, like we do in Italy, like we do in yeah. most places around the world, China has generation gulfs, which means that the distance between generations is significantly larger, as well as the pace at which our stereotypes about China become outdated is significantly faster. Uh, and And so that, you know, young China is also the recognition that Look, when most people talk about China, they're talking about old China. They're talking about the government. They're talking yeah. about state-owned enterprises. They're talking about the generation that is CEOs in publicly traded companies, uh, which is not yet this young generation. I mean, I is guess, a country sort of go on, Roberta? Sorry. I guess there are also differences in in like the new generation, like Gen Z, in China compared to, for example, in in Europe and in the US. Um, can you tell us more about this? Yeah, so when you're doing cohort to cohort comparisons, um, there's no doubt that there's actually more similarities between young people in China uh, than there are between old people in China. Like if you yeah. think about comparing Chinese boomers to American boomers, um, it's night and day. You know, in, in 1969, during the Woodstock Music Festival, which my dad was deciding whether or not to attend, that was the middle of the Cultural Revolution in China. Um, and, and there's a huge amount of anthropological wrapping around the decision to have to have, you know, sex, drugs and rock and roll to rebel yeah. against your parents, to rebel against the government. There wasn't any of that in China, obviously, as well as China was in deep poverty. So if you look at those two generations versus Gen Z in the West, you know, air quotes mm -hmm. here um, and Gen Z in China, there's far more similarities. Um, however, often those similarities get sort of left on the buzzword level, which is that they're more individual, they're mobile first, they they uh, create a large amount of their identity online rather than just offline. They uh, are much more interested in subcultures than big brands. You know, the older generation in China was very much the bigger, the Gucci belt, the better. Uh, yeah. And that was as much about social posturing as it was about enjoying what you were buying, that's changing now. However, when you look at the influences, the cultural influences, what people are, what this young generation is rebelling against and pushing up against, the consequences of individualization in the way that this young generation is interested, what it means to be masculine, what it means to be feminine, um, what's exciting, what, what, what keeps people up at night, what are their biggest fears? I, Even though the buzzwords are, are similar from Gen Z to Gen Z, the actual content uh, of those buzzwords when you sort of skim off the surface and, and dig around is still quite culturally unique in China, um, yeah, I, which is I, I have to say, a big pitfall for folks. I, I have to say, like having, so if you look at Chinese films, for example, a lot of them talk about this idea of a collective greater good. And then a lot of um, films you get coming out are t in the US talk a lot about a kind of Superman. So they talk more about the individual striving uh, for their own goals versus the collective, uh, an individual striving for a collective's goals. Would you say that is, is um, comes up in, in your book, Young China, and, and is still prevalent today? Or uh, Yes and no. Um, you know, in, so it, it comes up sort of in my book, Young China. Look, it came up with COVID, right? It was a, it was the most salient cultural point most political commentators have thought to make over the last bunch of years. Just because culture doesn't eke its way into politics that much, it just doesn't. But this idea that people were willing to wear masks, not to protect themselves, but to, but to protect other people, recognizing then that if other people did the same, then it would protect them. And that we just had none of that in, in many Western countries. Um, I mean, that's definitely part of Chinese culture. Um, on the other hand, there's a huge push towards individualization in, in China over the last decade, uh, two decades. And, um, and without sort of benchmarks, sort of deciding what you're comparing against. So compared to their parents, they're far more individual oriented. Compared to Western millennials and Gen Z, they're far more community oriented. Um, and those two yeah. sort of three dimensional spectrums, I think, are really important because um, relativity is otherwise important, I guess. Relativity is ultimately what defines something's something's significance, because otherwise you're just 
you know, in a vacuum, it's very difficult to yeah. understand this, this young generation. I think you picked up something, William, that I is a project actually, it was the, one of the first projects I pitched, um, which is this idea of, I, I think I called it something like the hero project, which is understanding yeah. how the myths that define our, or, or sort of inspire our cartoons and our, our children's stories um, from one culture to the other changes how we understand what it means to be a hero, what it means to be, uh, you know, the, the best of a of a people or place. And in the U.S., you you sort of picked up on this, and I think in a lot of the West, of course, I'm generalizing. But our heroes are supernatural. You know, they come from a different planet, Superman, and they yep. sort of fly around and they're really strong and oddly handsome. And or like Spider Man, they get bit by a spider and they have sort of freak powers. If if there's any NBA fans out there, it's a little bit like LeBron James. Uh, yeah. LeBron, you know, <laughs> like just like like physically superior. Um, and yeah. I, I was talking with the NBA about this as well as some some film houses, which is why I'm sort of blending blending these ideas here in China, you have the idea of a, of an average person who goes up onto a mountain, typically to a temple and practices one move for 30 years, goes down and saves the village. You know, so he's, he's of the community leaves, perfects himself through hard work, through grind, through grit. That Confucian and then comes back and <laughs> totally. Just, and right? so, yeah, yeah like it, there, it, there's totally the cultural principles that are embedded in these stories of heroism. Um, and you know, I'm from the Bay area. I'm actually in my childhood home right now, um, for a couple of days before we're actually getting ready to move back to China. Um, but like Steph Curry from the Warriors is a far better Chinese hero than LeBron James. Uh, he's undersized. Everyone said he was too slow, not skilled enough, uh, but through hard work and determination, he has redefined the league and redefined the game. And talking with some people from the NBA about this and, and how one character, you know, because athletes and celebrities ultimately are characters as they're presented, could have so much more appeal in China than, than another one. You know, people love LeBron in China, but Steph is there, is the people's champ. Mm -hmm. um, it reflects I mean, a lot of these sort of older cultural values as well. Definitely, definitely. And it I was thinking, um, going back to the, to the Gen Z, and you mentioned um, also something about um, parents as well. I guess um, another difference that um, there is in China is the, is the pressure that Chinese, um, young Chinese get um, about school, about the Gaokao, that maybe we don't have uh, in the, that much in the West. And maybe this could be also one of the reasons why China could be considered as like really competitive for people, for foreigners to go there and work there because people there have this work ethic and this, um, they're really hard working. And I remember one of my Chinese friends that mentioned one um, that said, in this world, there is no space for everyone. And this phrase like really um, remain in my, in my mind. Um, can you tell us more about this? Thing that young Chinese are experiencing in China? Yeah, it's so important. Um, and in a lot of ways, this was the biggest finding of my book. So um, by the way, just for those who are thinking about careers in China, I ended up starting, you know, I wrote a book that came out when I was 27. Um, I spent three or four years traveling around second and third tier cities in China. I was based in Chengdu. Um, and I thought I was going to be a journalist or an academic. Uh, and, and the book was sort of my bid for that, as well as trying to crystallize some of the research that I was doing and, and I'll truthfully legitimize a longer stay in China rather than having to get a job. Um, yep. I then spoke with journalists and academics who quickly dissuaded me from, from going into those fields. Uh, and <laughs> truthfully, like they this is- They themselves dissuaded have, you. <laughs> oh yeah, I have, I have one very strong memory of, I was, I was giving a book talk at the, um, Hong Kong Foreign, Correspond Foreign Correspondence Club. And a certain person who was, who was running it at the time had, had a drink or two. And after my talk told me to not go into journalism because it's a, it's a dying space was what he said. Um, and he also said that there's, he talked about the, the diminishing dignity in the field. Now, I think that's true for traditional journalism, but as the two of you are sort of uh, 
bringing to life here is there's a lot of other, you know, part of why there's diminishing dignity in the field of traditional journalism is because there's so many other ways to do it now. That's a larger story. But this idea of being able to bring sort of the resources of the of the private market and the interest of the of of the business world to do sociology research, which is what I mm -hmm. how I see my work, um, was really exciting. I just want to say that because it it helps to you know I'm talking about the book in one way and the business in another. Um, I see the two as really one one a continuation of the other. The biggest finding of the book was that the project of childhood in China is is really defined by pressure. And I say project of childhood really deliberately. What is a childhood for? That, yeah, that's interesting, um, way you, the way you've defined that. I don't think in the West we'd call a project of, of childhood, right? Like, uh, uh, it, it's what's, it's, it's so, I mean, the, the competition, and Roberta, you touched on this, competition to get into a good preschool, the competition to get into a good middle school, high school, the competition on the college market, the competition on the, uh, higher education market, the competition on the job market, the competition on the on the marriage market, and all of these milestones you're still, you're, you're meant to achieve before the age of twenty seven, uh, and then you know whiplash. You also have a year or two to figure out dating and love, get married, or you're considered you know a leftover woman, and the the pressure of that really can be best seen in in the two and three and now fully relaxed one child policy. Um, in 2015, when they were first relaxing the one child policy to two, I went around the country asking people, do you want to have a second child? And, and the most consistent answer I got was some version of no, because a second child would make both children half as competitive. The resources we wow. could put towards their education, the resources we could put towards their job opportunities, uh, towards buying an apartment for them, you know, which is an essential for young men who want to get married, uh, would just be cut in half. And why ruin the life of two kids when you could when you could give one child a, a much better chance in today's competitive society? And I just wanted to ask. So I understand you're currently looking at a second book. Um, could you maybe touch on or, or give us a hint of of the direction Ooh. of travel? You're talking about young China. I want to just have an understanding. You've already given us a, a ton of information and insight into, I guess, generational shifts, the old and new. What's this next book going to be going to be focused on? Do you reckon? So I haven't talked to anyone about this besides my editor at Harvard Business Review. Okay, <laughs> uh, but like for the magazine, not for the actual publisher. And then, um, and then just I've, okay. I've bounced it off some people, but I've started work on this literally the last two and two, two and a half weeks. And I say okay, that because okay. when I finished Young China, I wrote little notes to myself and actually put them around my childhood room, um, reminding myself that when I wanted to write another book, don't. <laughs> 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 book writing, book writing is really hard. And it's, and, and particularly the way that most people write books is, you know, you, you have every good idea you've ever had you want to put in there. And there's so much of yourself in it that you're not just putting out some ideas, you're putting out yourself, which is terrifying. And, you know, especially when you're 25, 26, 27, which is when I was writing it, um, there's a huge amount of pressure that comes with that. And so I, I've turned down a lot of book ideas easily over the years, but there's this one that's really stuck with me. And it's basically this. Um, China 2035, the 10 defining questions or the 10 questions that will define China's next decade, parenthetically, and it's already a bad okay. title because there's parentheses in it, um, but parenthetically, <laughs> as like told to by the, we <laughs> yeah, we're, we're workshopping this. Yeah. yeah if anyone ha like out there that. has like good that. ideas, <laughs> shoot me a text, um, as told by the world's 100 leading experts. So there's a few facets here. One of them is it's going to be essentially a, a small scale quantitative piece of research, which is that we're creating a data set of the 100 leading experts from around the world, diversified, of course, for gender, race, age, um, location, uh, political lean, and going to ask each of them what they believe are the most defining questions for China over this next decade. So it's also inherently forward looking rather than backwards looking. And 
rather than rely on the genius of any one intellectual, which is what most books are, um, I'm trying, the hope is to pool the collective um, here in order to help the world frame what's important about China. Um, because one of the one of the cool things that happened with Young China is I ended up getting to, to speak sort of across six different continents. I, I got to meet a lot of people and and sort of have conversations like we're having today. Yeah. And the most striking thing I realized was that not only did people not know the right answers, but they didn't even know the right questions to ask. And so they're left with what the media tells them every day. And the media is incentivized to sort of drive hysteria and drive clicks. And so every day it's this up and down roller, roller coaster, you know, big government, which is scary, big economy, which is exciting or scary, depending on the day. And, and so I'm trying to, it's a little bit like, instead of just watching the shore, you know, if you're looking at the ocean, just watching the shore and the violence and the, and the, you know, crashing of waves and it's entrancing, but it doesn't give you a sense for the whole oceanic system. I'm trying to pool the smartest people to talk to me about the currents and, and those things yeah. are going to be driving China for the next decade. I guess reading the ripples as well. <laughs> yeah. You know, I um actually, I think ripple was one of the early names um, for, for my company that I ditched, but this, this <laughs> sense of, this sense of what's, what's actually important so that we can frame a more constructive conversation yeah. about, about China instead of the sort of media hysteria that, that business people, investors, um, journalists to a certain degree I are prey to, but also click, like click, parents and neighbors, right? titles, I guess it gets a bit samey, right? The sort of clickbait. It's, yeah, it's, there's an article written by Ian Johnson, who's a phenomenal China journalist. Um, he wrote the soul, uh, I think either the soul or souls of China, which is a big difference. And I don't remember exactly, but he, he's a phenomenal uh, longtime journalist and scholar. And he followed around Peter Hessler, who is probably, you know, sort of the China author. We all kind of pray at his altar. Um, and <laughs> when, when Peter Hessler was doing his tour throughout China, his book tour, and Peter Hessler is very well received within China. Um, and Ian writes about how he was asked by somebody while he was sort of following around Peter, why is it that journalists write about the one bridge that fails when 999 don't? And it was this interest. It was a, it was a more reflective piece. I think it was in the New York mag and it caused like this moment of identity crisis for, for Mr. Johnson. And, and not, you know, of, of you know, it's true. It's it's sort of that's what the media is incentivized to cover. It's not their fault, and that stuff's important. But mm -hmm. trying to figure out what's what what's unique about the book format and the ability to look more long term, um, I think it'll have a, a calming effect on on those who read it, uh, as well as help people figure out what's okay. This is actually important. This is just noise. How do I separate the signal from noise? Yep. And I just, we just have time for one final question. And what I'd really like to ask is, where does this passion or interest for China come from? Where did it, where did it start? Oh, <laughs> it's a difficult one. <laughs> oh, I'm getting old. It's, I'm getting old. I, um, cause, cause it's different where it started versus why I'm still excited about it. So I can tell you where it started and then I can tell you why I, I'm still excited about it. Cause it's been. I first went when I'm when I was 20. I'm 32 now. Um, you know, young China is quickly turning into middle aged China in terms of my, my area of focus. Um, 20, 35. So, though, so. <laughs> yeah, gosh, I'm trying to, you know, because my interests change too, and they evolve over time. When I was young, I was really interested in what was on the ground, and and over the last couple of years, as I've had a more macro view, it's I'm I'm shocked by how poor the macro thinking is on China. So there's even been a shift in me when. When I first started with China, I was interested in the future and I was interested yeah. in a sorely misunderstood place. I was a big science fiction reader and there is a, there is a book or excuse me, there's a, there's a short story by a guy named Norm Spinrad, if I'm remembering this right. Um, imagining what the world would look like if it was led by an Eastern hegemonic power. 
So how we would do business, what people would wear, how people would eat, what airports would look like. I mean, the whole nine yards. Of course, that was written in the 90s, so it was about Japan. Um, but when it came time for me to study abroad, and I had I had never been to Asia. I, I, I was yeah. from California. I went to Columbia in New York, which was already a big culture shock for me. But I looked at the pamphlet for the University of Hong Kong, and it looked like the cover of Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Um, which would become the movie Blade Runner, a uh, science fiction classic. Yeah. And this idea that the future was unfolding somewhere else and I could go see it was extraordinarily exciting. I then would travel to Shenzhen pretty regularly. And, and that's when my interest became a little bit more substantial. The distance between what I was seeing and what I was hearing back home. You know, it's it's the most consequential and and in a lot of ways, the least understood place on earth right now. And, um, and so what keeps motivating me today is that same question. I wake up every day and I feel like I get to research and, and be interested in the, the most interesting set of identity and sociology and anthropological, as well as economic and political questions in the world. I don't think anyone is a more, in a more interesting space than, than us. And, um, yep. sure. There's other things that are, that are cool. <laughs> and, um, but I, I don't, there's nothing that has, has switched me on as intellectually as this. Um, and I, I'm grateful every day for it. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's all we've got time for, Zach, but that was absolutely phenomenal. And thank you so much for coming on Business and Bubble Tea uh, with us today. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'll, I'm expecting my bubble tea in the mail, by the way. I'm sure it'll be here in a few No days. worries. <laughs> it's on its way. <laughs> we'll, see you, we'll see you in China. <laughs> yeah, it's a deal. That's bubble. yeah. I'm gonna call, I'm gonna call in that bubble tea debt. I'll see you in Chengdu or Don't worry. somewhere. Shen Shenzhen. We'll be in Shenzhen. <laughs> All right, it's a deal.